Welcome to this webinar. We're going to talk about uh, strong metrics to show that your agile transformation matters. It's a hot topic, as demonstrated by a number of people here. And uh, it's the third webinar in our um, series, Agile Leadership Bytes, which are uh, have a specific format, just 30 minutes. So it's very short, very intense. Uh, so we are Agile Leader Academy. The whole company is here. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So uh, uh, basically, we are a boutique firm offering uh, uh, services to help leaders lead their organizations and, and teams in change and transformation and build adaptive organization, what is loosely called organizational agility. OK, uh, we do that with advisory, uh, coaching, and, and, uh, and training. And I'll let Daniel introduce himself in a, in a few seconds. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Many of you know me, and some of you, many of you don't. So I've been uh, basically in the project management game for, for many years. And uh, I guess about 13 years ago, I gravitated towards uh, what we know now as agility. I've never looked back. And uh, uh, both Bruno and I really now concentrate our, our efforts on the skills necessary for uh, um, leadership agility, which is um, the prime ingredient. Uh, you know, Stephen Denny just wrote an article this week saying that the age of agile hasn't quite arrived and one of the reasons is we still need to move forward with more agility in our leadership so you know these all of the um, webinars that we've been presenting have been had, had a focus on that and today we're going to be looking at organizational metrics so bruno without further ado if you want to share the uh, presentation and we'll be off to the races yeah, voila you should be seeing um, a slide yep. right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we want to address a very specific challenge today because with metrics, as you know, we can go all over the place and then we discuss about nothing. A very specific challenge because, frankly, as agile professionals, we are usually quite good to design and manage metrics among professionals and among people who are close to the transformation in every day. But when it's time to demonstrate value at a higher level, I'm talking here, business leaders, executives, senior, direct, senior directors, and so on, then we tend to get in trouble. And one of the reasons that agile transformation, like all transformations, is not a revenue generating initiative. Okay, uh, So inherently, it's not easy. But uh, there are other reasons for that. And I remember a, a few years ago, I was witnessing a presentation of uh, a job transformation leader to senior executives in a large organization. Uh, and uh, she was showing like very high level benefits. You know, oh, thanks to agility, we're going to improve market share, employee happiness, and all these things. But I could see that these executives were not really, really convinced because, you know, there are many things going on in the organization, other initiatives, other transformations, IT, HR, and so on. So it's a very bold claim to say that agility is going to directly impact that by some amount. You see what I mean? She also had other types of metrics. For example, something very down to earth, operational, factual, like the number of scrum masters, classic one, right? Number of agile projects, all very good. But for these decision makers, this is not really the level they need to make decisions such as where do we put our money? Is what we're doing working or not? And so what happened in this particular case? All these decision makers, the executives, they focus on what they understood the best, which is a very small metric there with a dollar sign in front of it, the cost. And as you know, when decision makers focus on the cost, whatever your initiative is, is always bad news because it means that we failed to convey value in a compelling way. And with Daniel, we saw this kind of, these very different versions of this story to mm -hmm. unfold in many different situations, small transformations, big ones over a few months, over a few years. So we go through this over and over again. It's like Groundhog Day. And we feel there are things we can do to avoid that, okay? And so we're going to go through a number of metrics. We're going to take that backward. First, we're going to show what tends not to work very well. And thanks to that, we're going to convert. In to, terms okay. of organizational transformation. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then we're also, going to convert. Yeah, go, go ahead. Just, a word, just a, a word that we wanted to say, Bruno. Uh, we're not talking about OKRs here. We're not going to get into that. OKRs are a completely different uh, 
par in OKRs or a paradigm shift. So we're concentrating for today in this short session on good old fashioned KPIs, key performance indicators. Just wanted to make sure that we touched upon that. Yeah, it's a very good precision because metrics can mean many different things to many different people. So we try to focus really on this particular challenge today. Okay. So let's get that going. The first type of metrics we want to avoid, at least in part, would be a bit more nuanced about that, is things that are more technical, about the technicity of agility. These are oops type metrics. We have to be careful with that. The first one, classic. That's really, of course, comes back to the, to the genesis of agility, software delivery metrics. We know that in all organizations today, even if they are software centric, software is not the only thing in their value creation process. So if you base your metric essentially on that, then you know that you're going to miss some stuff. There will be services, there will be training. There, there are other parts that are important to deliver value for the organization mm -hmm. to have an effect uh, uh, on the business, business benefits than software metric, even in software and centric organizations. And this is not to say, by the way, that we're going to present a couple of pages of OOPS metrics, but they're OOPS in terms of selling the transformation and selling the benefits at an organization level. Obviously, you need software delivery metrics if part of the component of what you're developing is software, but they should be used for what they're intended to do. Exactly. It's like when you focus on that, you know this problem. But they are good it's for all something. a question of focus. Yeah. There are no necessarily bad metrics. Uh, implement, uh, implementation metrics surrounding methods and tools. Uh, this is another classic one for you know what we've seen repeatedly in organizations is well, how many members, how many of our members of the workforce are in insert agile workflow tool name here? Right. Well, we've got 687 people, you know, registered on our workflow tool. Therefore, we are agile. All right. And the same goes for how many people are practicing or how many people are buying into the framework we're rolling out. Well, again, that's sort of, it might be good to know this, but you're not going to sell anyone on that transformation with this. Next the one. Third, up, the third one, very classic to output based metrics. Of course, when you talk about benefits, you talk about outcomes. So when we have metrics that are too focused on output, we know there's something wrong. They can be very good usually as leading operational metrics, but they're not good, not very good at demonstrating value delivery for the transformation itself. For example, and we mentioned before, number of projects, number of this, number of that, number of scrum masters, number of people certified, number of people going to the courses. All of these things are outputs. They're good leading metrics. They're, they have some interest, but they will not enable decision makers to answer these key questions that we, we are, um, uh, we showed before. Then there's our attempts at doing it all. So, you know, really trying to um, starting a transformation or starting an evolution evolutionary initiative and in what we call the agile inflation effect. All of a sudden we realize, rightfully so, that this touches upon many, many aspects of the organization. But once the initiative has been launched and you keep encountering more and more stakeholders. You know, the time to identify stakeholders and the time to get them aligned is before you start. If you initiate a transformation from within a silo, you are necessarily going to run into massive scope creep as you expand outwards from the initial from the initial impact. And you're going to wind up with you know everyone and their uncle wanting to bring in their own metrics. And then you're going to slowly ground to a chaotic stop. How many times have we seen the situation also, then what happens then is there, you, you start to seeing infighting of, amongst the silos and amongst even lines of business as to who is going to be responsible for implementing quote unquote agility. Yeah, that was a very big one indeed. The agile inflation effect, you know, becomes transformation of everything and everyone. Uh, another one that is interesting that uh, I, actually I lived through a few years ago, an exhaustive mathematical model, which, you know, we, most of us are analytical. So it's very compelling, very attractive when we see things that, a, a cascade of KPIs, you know, 
feeding each other with medical, mathematical formulas. Blink, blinking, and you change dashboards. one thing and everything's like cascading in an application. It, it, it looks great, you know, it looks as if we are in control of everything, except it doesn't work. Because as you know, agility is about behavior and emergence. So it's not really possible to pinpoint exactly the cause and effect of everything. And trying to do so will create a gigantic and unwieldy, I would say, model. And in this particular experience I have in mind, at some point, managers had to spend half a day per week just to keep the model alive. And so they, they ended up dropping it. So be careful with that. It's a slippery slope, but if you're using tools to define metrics, you know, there are many tools, it's easy to like bring a new metrics, like a drag and drop thing. And then before you know it, you have something that is that looks beautiful, but actually is not really usable. And then you have, you know, uh, basically silo metrics or, or a metric for everyone. So even beyond silos, it's just like um, looking at even going into workflows and looking at the performance or looking at the tasks of a specific individual or looking at how the workflow treats a certain step in the process and deriving metrics for that silo or for, for that group of individual contributors based on that. So yeah, the business analysts might be producing X user stories per, per, per sprint or you know, X number of work items per, per month. But again, that's an output based metric. So you have to be very careful. They're not very convincing metrics to use at the enterprise level. So moving right along. Yeah. Last one of our oops section, very quick because uh, with time is flying, right? Too good to be true. Okay. Yeah, because it's easy to show something that looks good. One of the ways to do that is to show one particular dimension. And this often depends on where the transformation is born in. If it comes from, let's say, IT, it will be a lot about product delivery and so on. And maybe some parts like employee satisfaction or learning will, will, will be pushed aside. If transformation is more like uh, the seed has been planted more in HR, often it will be more about employee satisfaction, behaviors and so on, but maybe less product, for example. And so depending on uh, the, the, the genesis of your transformation, some dimension can be uh, more, uh, have more emphasis than others to the point that the others uh, are kind of pushed aside. And of course, if you don't measure something, people will not pay attention to it. So the blind spots will create a lot of negative effects. Although the, the thing you show look good, there are many things that are in the shadows and not going very well. So we'll look at that right after to, to have balanced, uh, balanced metrics. So knowledge-based metrics. So this is typical of large implementation plans where we see that, okay, 500 people have been trained. So training is great, training is necessary, but what comes after the training is where the actual evolution and where the actual progress will be made. So concentrating specifically on knowledge-based metrics, number of certifications. Um, it's good to know, and it's, it, it's a sign that certainly you are pushing the knowledge out there and making it available, but basing it and trying to use it as an argument for the organizational transformation is not necessarily the way to go. And very last one here, vanity metrics, kind of combination of things we already saw before. Vanity metrics is like the process, conscious or unconscious, that we try to come up with metrics that make us look good. And uh, usually it starts with a small metric, like uh, I lived an experience where we produce tools for agile transformation, like for example, a new model for project charter, you know, and things like that. And progressively, as we progress on that, we're very proud that we produce more agile tools, right? more agile practices, document, and so on. And little by little, this little metric there becomes more and bigger and bigger and becomes the, the, the center of our dashboard. And it's kind of frees us from the need to show that we, that we, we produce real benefits. So vanity metrics uh, uh, makes us look good and it can happen to the best of us. It's like, again, it's, a, it's, it's like slipping progressively to, to things we are in control of lack number of people in training and so on. And in the end, it becomes like the thing we're proud of, so we show it everywhere. Even, Although, the, even the number of agile projects can become a vanity metric if we're not looking at how those, how our agility is affecting the, the lead time of those projects and the, the, those customer deliverables. So now we get to the more positive aspect and we look at some of our recommendations. So we're going to recommend, again, 
this is this is not you know the, the you know the truth you know passed on to you from high on the mountain. This is just a stab at this from our, from our from our experience, and we we break this down into four major top level metric categories, which are customer satisfaction, speed of value delivery, learning and innovation, and basically employee or stakeholder happiness, workers happiness. So if we go to the first one, customer satisfaction. Yeah, and you'll notice okay. that we have leading and lagging. Uh, we're going to show you leading and lagging indicators. The lagging indicator is going to be in this sort of uh, amber color. The leading ones will be in green. So uh, yeah. we like trends. We like scalars. So you know, net you know, net promoter score trend. If you track the trend over time during during the weeks and months and years of your evolution, well, hopefully there should be some kind of bump there. Right? Yeah. If you're not affecting your net promoter score, if you're not affecting your, your customer satisfaction in any measurable way, then where are you going? But Daniel, typically the, the trend, the NPS trend actually can also be a very overarching metric that is precisely too, too broad. This is why we, it could be used, but what we discovered right. in experience is that typically we use a targeted NPS. For example, in a, let's say a bank, some some com, some products are like check accounts and so on, uh, and they don't need agility; they're very stable. But some parts of the products or services they offer, like for example, some new products or services for for Gen Z or millennials, uh, there is much more uncertainty, so they use more agility uh, in this part of the organization. So what works well is that we target the NPS for a segment or product, or you have to characterize the NPS on a part of the organization where agility makes a difference so that you claim saying that within this part, GHR transformation has an effect, this claim is legitimate. And often if you look at NPS broadly, it's, it's just too broad. So you've got to use targeted NPS. And that, that's a tough one, that's a tough one. Moving along to speed of value delivery. We're gonna introduce one here that you know, that, that is a catch-all, um, bit of an end of a sub subcategory on its own, enterprise focus factor. So enterprise focus factor is what we basically refer to as, are you focusing it and prioritizing it at the enterprise level? In other words, are you reducing your work and process, the number of projects that you're actually working on? One way of calculating this would be, you know, um, basically how many, how many projects have you stopped? Right, it's like the old saw: stop starting and stop starting and stop finishing. Well, it takes organizational courage and political uh, political courage to actually get over this absolute obsession that most organizations have with throwing more work into the hopper. So, if you can somehow track that and say, "Hey, we prevented 16 projects from starting because they were just being started because uh, you know." stakeholders are used to things taking a long time so they're throwing more so we'd like to say that an ad, that you know that um, a highway full of ambulances is still a traffic jam right uh, employee focus factor um, many times i've seen bruno has seen many of you in the audience have seen this you know the individual contributors are on up to five are assigned up to five projects and it gets worse in transformation because some of them are going to five stand-ups a day because of the um dogmatic way in which the, the 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 framework is being rolled out so you know we we know the cost of multitasking from numerous studies about five projects 80 percent of your day is absolute mental waste lost to context switching you want to do the lead time uh... yeah lead time uh, basically lead time is i think a bit more common i think so you it's a time between you start start a product or feature and it's delivered but delivered in the sense that in the hands of customers or users, like the little package in the hand there, and the image is really in, in your hand. And there you got lead time. So it remains an important uh, metric for speed of value delivery. Uh, it's a, it's a, lead, a lagging metric in this, in this case. So you can see how the, the other two are leading into, basically, if you can work on your focus factors as leading indicators, you will get better lead time as a lagging indicator. Moving on to learning innovation, streamlining ratio. This is a, something we've baptized as a, it's a subcategory. And basically it's a proxy, um, um, it, it's a proxy for how well aligned your stakeholders are and how adaptive your governance is. So one example of streamlining ratio is look at, look at uh, you know, if you are 
Um, are you retiring obsolete, redundant um, uh, uh, policies, procedures, uh, and processes, or are you adding on? So the, the classic example of a poor streamlining ratio is when transformations lead to, well, we're still doing, let's take an IT example, we're still doing use cases and use, usage case scenarios, but we also now then transform all that into user stories. Or we're going to keep project managers doing all the same reporting work they used to do, but now they're also called scrum masters and they're responsible for getting everyone to stand up at 9.30 every morning. So it's a process of accretion. Are you accreting yet another layer now called of these agile so-called ceremonies and processes on top of everything else? Or are you substituting, replacing, simplifying and streamlining? So there's ways you can calculate that. Um, safety to experiment. This one is tied into one that is we're going to see with workers' happiness. This one, um, uh, the Agile community for a long time called it safety to fail. I've always despised that because in the, in the ears of the C-suite, the C-suite does not want to hear fail. It's basically failure is a sub category of learning. And, and learning comes from experimentation. So why would you concentrate on the one negative sort of subcategory that comes from learning? It's, it's just, it seems like it's, you know, because it's provocative, it was, you know, it was adopted, but it's more about safety, about safety around learning. And yes, you can stumble and fall and dust yourself off. That's what the, 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 the failing thing is, but I never liked it. And finally, as a lagging indicator, are you actually learning from these things? Or are you doing the same, you're making the same mistake three times over? That would be a fail. That would definitely be a fail. So are you sharing this out? Are you becoming a learning organization? Yeah, which means that we have to measure learning. And there are ways to do that. If you read, for example, Eric Ries, uh, in Startup, uh, Innovation Accounting, and so on, there are ways Wait, to Wait, number of people learning. who went to class, number of people uh, were certified and took a class, right, uh, Bruno? That's that's how to measure learning? <laughs> okay. One, yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay, last one very quick because I see that uh, we are a bit short of time for the discussion. Uh, workers' happiness, always important, you know? Uh, happiness surveys, whether people are happy, is a classic one. The pace of work, do we have a sustainable pace of work? Again, question uh, to the workers. And agency, I will let Daniel explain agency. Yes, yes, it's my... not necessarily very common in this kind of. Uh, no, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's it's my word of 2022 and 21. This is baby. And and, and 20, <laughs> it's a subcategory. So, uh, are people taking control of their own destiny? And how there's there's a number of proxies for this. And first of all, are they staying retention? Second, are they recommending people from their network to come work with you? That's another one. But ultimately, are they self-selecting for products or initiatives? Are they coming forth with passion? Are they bringing their whole selves to work? It is a, basically it is the result of psychological safety at the fourth level, which is challenger safety. And you do not unlock agency until you've reached, you've really created a fully psychologically safe space. So hard to attain, but once you've channeled, once you've channeled, channeled say, uh, agency, uh, there's no stopping the organization and the people within it. Yeah. And to finish on this slide, we have to understand that these four dimensions, uh, they are broad metric categories and most transformation at work and agility that succeeded were well balanced between them. So it's natural that there is tension between these, these four categories. Because this is what it is about decision making. You have to make trade off decision making. Sometimes you go a bit more on one side, and then the other side is a little bit uh, lower for some time. You know, so it's natural that there are uh, you need polarities to, that, within the polarities. Within these, uh, the polarities and tension are intentional. You need to counterbalance things. You need to, you know, one category metric has to be counterbalanced by another. So basically, you have to have as balanced an approach as you can. You know, back in the the eighties and nineties, the balanced scorecard we were early attempts at doing just this. Right, just that. So now that we we've have you know a couple of decades more under our belt in terms of collective experience. Um, so with that, we're gonna you know the last few minutes we'd like to turn over to to questions, comments, you know, violent emotional reactions. There's been some some great uh, some great stuff in the chat. Yeah, we can start with something from the chat, Daniel. And there were comments here from um, from um, Norma, Nolan McConnell. I always make sure metrics are used for conversation, catching trends rather than punishment. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. different things in this sentence. Uh, I can start. Indeed, the, the metrics is not something that's purely intellectual. 
metrics is, a, is an excuse to start a conversation about something that's important, right? So it's a, it's a way to uh, uh, to have co people collaborate with, with each other about something that individually probably they can't solve. Daniel, want to add something about that? Uh, no, I'm just going through the, the chat here. Um, um, interesting metric can start a conversation. We'll never finish it, Ross, yes. There is always a more complex story behind it. Yes, Metric says, I can't say it enough. Metrics are proxies for something happening, right? They're your window into something happening. I always say that even the best metrics are best to check engine light. You don't really know which part of the engine. You have a sense, you have a clue. But there's been knocking, you know, and, and but uh, it, it just means you have to investigate it, basically. Uh, story, a uh, uh, quick, quick Notice we did not once did we mention story points or velocity. That is the, the level to which we are uncomfortable with those concepts now. The question Sorry. there, which which of these are surveys? Okay, but typically I will use this question to answer a bigger question I should have, have in mind. Objective versus, versus subjective. We didn't talk about that. You know, typically the word subjective has a negative connotation. Oh, subjective is like, oh, don't use that. It's not clear, it's not accurate, it's not true. It depends who the subjects are. Subjective can be powerful when you ask the right people because not only you have the right answer, but you engage people the same way. You ask them to delight that, okay? So they will be engaged with information. So don't see subjective as something negative. Uh, surveys, if they are short to the point, are fine the organization. But it's for managers, for workers, for all levels. If they are really to the point, they will provide very rich um, uh, data that will translate, translate into strong metrics. A couple other quick questions here. How would you apply a Benoit enterprise focus factor for uh, stable teams? So then again, Benoit, it's a question of disassociating the team from its overall environment. So a stable team can still be subjected to, you know, gross inefficiencies and redundancies in terms of the deliverables they're expected to to, to fill in in terms of the governance that surrounds them. So if the team itself is stable, I would look at how adaptive my governance is basically and make sure that, you know, they aren't doing things in, in, in you know, triplicate. Uh, so it becomes a question of removing the, um, the bureaucracy really. Um, uh, John, do you have case studies of organizations? Well, we, uh, we have our own case studies of the last, you know, combined 30 years, Bruno and I, and uh, you folks all have your, your own experiences. Um, case studies, um, I mean, if you know, a good search of the net will yield some. I personally subscribe to something called the Enterprisers, which is Red Hat. It's, you know, they have a constant stream of articles around digital transformation, agile transformation. There's often case studies there. So the Enterprisers. Uh, so, um, Basically, so it's just a question of, you know, there is no single um, case study that we're basing this on. It's mostly our experience and obviously keeping up with thought leadership and so on. Daniel, I see that we have reached the end of our webinar. It was pretty we short and pretty intense. You cannot say the opposite, right?